he's the foundation for all of Western thought, including religion, including Christianity. If you want to understand the culture that created you, if you want to understand yourself, Homer is the skeleton key. You won't understand how the world works politically if you don't read Machiavelli, because everyone in power, no matter what they say, are functionally Machiavellians. Um, and the problem if you stick them in the public school is they're, they're largely imitating other kids who also don't know what they're doing. They want not just to fight, but sometimes to die. We could be living in a completely woke world in 2022 and wake up in 2026 and like, not only is no one woke, but everyone claims that they were never woke. Like complete cognitive dissonance it wasn't just that Trump won, it was that he won the popular vote. It was like an em the emperor has no clothes moment. How do we make the most of the very short season we have with our kiddos and really enjoy every moment of it? Okay, dads, we have a fantastic episode for you today. We have C.B. Robertson. He is an engineer by trade, but this man is one of the smartest individuals that I've ever interviewed in my entire life. He focuses primarily on classical literature, classical philosophy, and how that can improve upon our lives. Expect to learn in this why we need to read philosophy, why we need to study the classics, how the era of Trump is a game changer for men and fathers in particular, and why reading Homer will completely change your life. This is a great episode. Please stick with it the whole time. There's some huge nuggets in here. We'll get right to it right now. Thanks. What is the current state of men and dads in particular in today's society? Oh, what a question. I would say alienation. I would say men are feel separated from I mean, as as a rule there's there's always exceptions I've, i i work with a bunch of blue collar guys in the trades and construction mostly electricians but you run into you know plumbers carpenters drywallers the the whole type and um you know some of them get along fine but it it, it seems like as as the, the the general sort of spirit of the the culture is men feel uh not at home at home not we, at home at home so they're yeah. at home they're living their life they are supporting their family but they kind of feel not themselves well it's 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 not their place yeah um that that, that that's my impression anyways and again there's there's plenty of guys who've, who've figured out um you know they've figured out their lives such that they make it work and they and they do feel at home at home um you know, and, and not just the single guys. There's <laughs> always like the, the sort of MGTOWs and, and a, a certain substrain of the, the so-called red pill crew who, who think, you know, the, the way is to be individual and single and apart. But um, you know, I, I spent some time as an over-the-road truck driver and uh, it was great. Uh, but every once in a while, you get the, the, that moment of just absolutely crushing loneliness and like just that occasional moment is enough to motivate you to want to endure whatever kinds of menial frustrations and, and petty irritations come with living with other people. Because that's that's the kind of animals that we are. It's the kind of we are we are pack animals like chimps or wolves or not quite lions, chimps or wolves. We'll stick with that. Right. So you you get that urge. You're the over the road trucker. You feel like okay, I need to make a change in my life. I need to settle down, have kids. Is there a time when you don't feel at home at home when you have achieved those things and you have the the kids? Um, how does that kind of come into play? Well, I mean, th there's always there's always moments of stress, you know, because we we guys have our preferred way of doing things, our preferred way of living. I think I think a large number of men would be quite content to live out of tents in the woods without much in the way of technology or amenities or even running water. Um, 
you know, until maybe you get past a certain age and you're like, eh, it would be nice to have a Tempur-Pedic bed or something. <laughs> but, um, you know, for the most part, I think we, we create civilization for, um, partially for status, partially for women, partially for children. Um, and for fun, you know, it, it's, it's cool to see what we can create, but, um, you know, the, the civilization requires maintenance. <laughs> um, and uh you know, i think guys are very when we're not acutely mission driven we're very hobby driven and and so when when we aren't allowed to have our either either an important meaningful mission or a hobby that we enjoy intrinsically there's a sense of well why who am i living this life for <laughs> you know uh, and that, that that's the sense i get from a lot of guys anyways who who have this like you know work is an escape from the um the dissatisfaction and the the unappreciatedness of of being at home unfortunately yeah i i i feel i feel that you know and it's so easy to wake up in the morning help your wife get the kids ready for school get them out get into work kids come home from school you put them to bed, you eat dinner, and then you start that grind over again, right? So that repetitive component to life will will grind on a on a man and on a father. Um, so I can see that challenge. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, there's there's kind of a a culture that which I, I believe is swinging pretty hard the other direction now, but we've we've gotten a lot of momentum that is just, for lack of a better phrase, like anti-masculine. And um, derogatory towards everything male, um, see, seeing men as really inferior citizens compared to the the, the more at home in the consensus um, female counterparts. I want to get back to that. I've got a whole set of questions on the effeminate man in our society today, um, Chris. I think I think that will be a fantastic point of the discussion. Before we get there, though. Um, why should men in particular study philosophy? Oh, well, um, <laughs> off the bat, it's fun. Uh, <laughs> if you're a certain type of person, um, I mean, it is an open question whether everyone should study philosophy. Um, I have, I, I have a, a, a selfish desire to, to sort of keep philosophy a little bit obscure, uh, and, and boring because, you know, anything that becomes too popular, it begins to get diluted in its quality. You only want the people to come in who, who want to come in. But I, I, from my own experience, the, the value of philosophy has been pretty extraordinary. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic tool for identifying nonsense. Um, won't always get you to the truth. <laughs> won't always get you to the correct answer. Uh, but it, it is very helpful in identifying bad arguments or people that are being manipulative, even interestingly, when you don't have any idea what they're talking about, uh, when you don't have any subject matter knowledge, you can listen to someone speak and be like, I don't know anything about this field, but I can see the form of what they're saying is incorrect and is, is not trustworthy. This is, this is the structure of a bad argument. And that's not, not true. Um, so that's been useful. And, and I would say at a more sort of personal level, it gives you the, the ability to connect with some of the most brilliant minds in history. I mean, the, the beauty of, you know, learning soccer is you get to appreciate the brilliance of Pele or Zidane or these people. If you learn a little bit about f fighting, and MMA or boxing, you can appreciate what it is that you're watching when you see Mike Tyson go to town. You know, the, 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 the development of a skill allows you to appreciate people who are excellent in that skill in a way that you, you didn't have before. And we spend most of our time in our minds, you know? So when you, when you develop the skills of thinking and, and some background in thinking, you can appreciate the extraordinary brilliance of people you you who are extremely generous and complimenting my intelligence i'm relatively intelligent i am i am not a genius though i'm i'm um 
you know, a, above average, but I'm not a, 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 I'm not a genius. We'll put it that way. Um, but if you study these things and you develop that, you begin to see people who actually are geniuses. Um, and you're like, oh, wow, this is, this is extraordinary. And, and just that, that ability to appreciate excellence, which I've experienced in the trades. One of the most incredible things about learning trades is you go into, you see buildings differently. You go into a restaurant and you're like, whoever did this trim work did a really good job, you know, that kind of thing. It, it changes how you read books. It changes how you have conversations. It's, it's, it's just improves your experience of the world. Uh, at least that's been my experience. We are so, as you said, in our own heads, especially in this day and age with social media, we have goldfish memories, right? And mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing to think back to two, 3,000 years ago, reading some of these texts, maybe a little bit less than that, right? And seeing how these people had no internet, they had no ability to fly where they wanted to go, but they had such a grounded appreciation for the physical life and what it meant to be who they were, and especially what it meant to move on um, to to um, an, an afterlife, so to speak, right? So pretty profound. So you can tap into that with, with these philosophers. Yeah. And, and, well, what's extraordinary is so much of philosophy, at least in the old world, you read like like Plato and Aristotle, is built upon that old world experience of life. Um, Plato, who um, the philosopher Whitehead said, all of philosophy is a footnote to Plato. See, he brought up all the subjects <laughs> um, and, and gave a, a first answer to, to everything, kind of. Um, you know, his world was built on the, the dreamlike vision of existence that is Homer um, in the Iliad and the Odyssey. If you read the Iliad and the Odyssey, it's a profoundly physical world. Everyone is going from somewhere to somewhere else. They're fighting with each other. They're negotiating with each other. They're trying to navigate the tricky dynamic of host and guest and um, trying to navigate economic questions. What's, what is worth more? You know, th th this or that, uh, you know, this tripod or my life or honor or glory or, you know, perhaps not being seen, but surviving. Um, you know, all of these questions were, were visceral, vital questions, not of abstraction, but of, of everyday life, or at least that's the sense you get. And one of the beauties of, of, of reading Homer is the time he takes to poetically describe whenever, does, whenever someone does something with excellence. It's a, a persistent object of focus in his poetry, and it's the physical excellence in the craftsmanship or the skill of the character, um, which is which is always inspiring to go back to. Yeah, and translates to exactly what you just said, right? So you're able to appreciate the trades, the HVAC, the electrical work that's been done in a building that you've gone to. Yeah, that makes sense. So you mentioned Iliad and Odyssey. So what <laughs> motivated you as a kid um, learning more about you to pick up Iliad Odyssey from Homer and start diving into that. Oh man, um, I don't remember exactly. <laughs> I remember reading the Iliad in particular in um, my senior year of high school and, and getting into it, and it was um, it was just a it was so different, and at the same time the feelings expressed by the character were so familiar um, psychologically that it gives this very uncanny experience of a sort of there, but for the grace of God go I, I could have been in this world, you know, 3,200 years ago or whenever thereabouts the, the events took place allegedly. Um, and it, it, it creates a sense of a sort of universality of what it means to be human. Like, like things really have not changed that much. I mean, everything has changed technologically um, and in how we live our lives and, and what we do for a living and how we move around and so forth. And yet, at the same time, nothing has really changed in what we care about, what we want, what we want from each other, how we 
manipulate and trick and deceive and get back at each other, how we reconcile with each other. Like the, the, the mechanisms are all socially are all exactly the same as they were then. And um, it creates one of the, the arguments I, I most enjoy getting into with people uh, is when people talk about how everything's going to hell in a handbasket, how everything is, is terrible today and uh, morals are declining and so forth. And it's very easy if you've read the Iliad and the Odyssey and, and other classical texts. I think one of the first one of the first written records ever from was it Babylon? I don't remember where exactly. It it predates the Iliad and the Odyssey. It was someone declaring the downfall and doom of society because you know sons no longer respect their fathers and people don't care about the gods and everybody's trying to write a book. Uh, <laughs> this is a complaint. And it's it, it's exactly the same complaint that everyone has had all time. So it's like, one of two things has to be true. Either one, we have been on a constant, steady decline in quality of our species for the last 4,000 years. It's possibly one. Or maybe we've got some retrospective bias some nostalgia <laughs> working in, in in how we judge things and maybe maybe the the 80s weren't as superior to the present day as we remember it being with our the you know fond childhood memories or or so forth now I, I as you can probably tell by my framing i think the latter is probably more accurate yeah well and we're doomed to repeat our history um you know whether it was 3,000 years ago, or somebody still wants to write a book and get ahead today. Um, yes, the, exactly. The Do doomed and also itself. blessed. Right. Doomed and also blessed. Because because there's, um, as Joseph Campbell says, it's a it's a it's a wonderful opera that we we have the, the 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 good fortune to be able to participate in, except that it hurts. And so the the challenge is enduring the pain of this grand opera um, decently. And, and not forgetting the good parts when it happens to hurt. You've, you've talked about briefly, and it kind of goes back to when you're younger, when you're in college, you have a more liberal progressive mindset. And then as you get older and you become a father and you pay taxes, you become much more conservative as things go, generally speaking. You've alluded to that as it relates to reading the Iliad and the Odyssey. Reading Iliad first... Seems like the way to go when you're younger so you can get an appreciation for things and then moving on to Odyssey. Is that still hold true for you or do I have those backwards? No, no, that's exactly right. And and I, I, I stole this actually from probably the best author introducing Homer out there, a, a gentleman by the name of Adam Nicholson, not even a classicist. Um, he's, he's a journalist by profession, but he wrote this book called Why Homer Matters, also the, the the English title is The Mighty Dead. And it's it, he it's this you know grand broad scope introduction of all things Homer. The, the the history, the language, the the geography, um the the, the historicity, some of the archaeology, uh, all, all the different facets of Homer and the poetry and stuff. Uh, but he also talks about it personally. Um and uh, his own relationship with Homer, he, he apparently gets a, a kick out of asking people, are you an Iliad or an Odyssey person? Uh, if they say they've read Homer. And it makes me laugh every time I read it because everyone who hears that question immediately understands there's no intrinsic reason why you should be either an Iliad person or an Odyssey person. And yet at the same time, they realize they are. And everyone is... Almost everyone is one or the other. And I was very much an Iliad kid um, in my teens, early 20s. And I think it's because it appeals to the heroic impulse of young men. They want not just to fight, but sometimes to die. Uh, they want to be immortalized in a heroic, glorious fashion. Um, it's, a, it's a strong impulse that I think many, if not most men, have felt at some point in their lives. And the Iliad taps into that. And it also taps into the feelings of injustice that many young men feel when they see their 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 social superiors appear to be their inferiors in matters of competence or um, honor, um, which is a 
another very common experience. You know, it's the, the, the naive young warriors book. And I think that's, that's very appealing to a lot of people. Um, but then, you know, and, and, and to that young person, the Odyssey looks like it's a story about a kind of dubiously honorable, uh, cunning trickster archetype, just doing a bunch of things. And you're like, that's, you know, for kids, uh, or something. This is, this, you know, this is, this is like Watership Down is, is where this belongs. That's just a story about the Odyssey for those of you who don't know, but, but with rabbits, um, yeah, or, or, you know, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou or something. But then as you get older, you begin to s sense, and, and this is actually in the Odyssey, the, the sort of, uh, the dissatisfaction of the sort of heroic path. It is still a beautiful thing. You don't want to become totally disillusioned. You don't want to let that like part of your soul die. Um, but there's more to life and to success and to, um, you know, happiness, uh, and excellence as a man than just these, um, you know, righteous anger and martial, martial prowess, you know, that, that, the, these skills in navigating tricky social circumstances are really what make the world go round. Um, and, and that's where Odysseus shines. And it's, it's, a, it's a more subtle story. It's a, a much more metaphorical story. Many of the characters, uh, their names actually directly tell you what they symbolize. So for example, um, Calypso, the goddess he's trapped with, is the, the encloser, one who traps in entombs, one might say. Uh, Polyphemus means many stories. The, the, the Cyclops, who symbolizes heroism itself, um, who eats men alive that that's what he's doing and it's it's i think it's a little bit harder for young men to think um in that kind of metaphorical indirect manner they're much more literal much more direct much like achilles in their in their personality um and then you you get some spend some time in the world uh <laughs> spend some time with women and you begin to see the value of um of being a multifaceted, being a little bit more complex, um, not leaning too heavily into this this ideal of the simple man, uh, which we sometimes see in American music and in other places as well. You have to be both a warrior and a poet in today's society. Society. Um, John Lovell, John Lovell sure. would be very yeah. proud. Yes, he's his his book, The Warrior Poet Way, is 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 profound. I think any father should read it because you have to, just like you said. You have to be able and willing to die violently if necessary, but your wife will not stand for you to be that warrior in the house around your children every single every single minute. So it's been I, fascinating. I always I always I I hesitate to lean into that too much because it's become John Lavelle has succeeded so well in in promulgating the phrase, but I I always felt a, fe a special connection to it because my um. Robertson side, um, we, uh, according to legend, got our last name um, directly from Robert the Bruce in Scotland, who 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 delivered the lines in that movie, um, at Braveheart. They fought like warrior poets. Um, wow. That John Lavelle borrowed that from. But I was I just love that ideal from that name. Turns out I, I I learned this many years after we. <laughs> deeply invested into our Robertson family that we're, we're actually related to a different Robertson family in the Shetlands, not the main one this time, but it's Take still it. a great line. I, I won't tell anybody. To... <laughs> John Lavelle You're took it generous. from you. You started it. Okay. okay. <laughs> and, and we all took it from whoever directed Br Mel Gibson. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Great philosophy is, is, is such a profound thing. I, I, I feel like, as you said, um, you kind of want to keep it tight while at the same time, I think it's so darn important to push out, especially to men like you, me, and, and the other gentlemen that, that are watching us right now. My father, as a perfect example, um, got his master's in philosophy and then moved on into the business world. 
Um, and he ran a company. He ran a construction company. He was the most incredible mentor and father to me before passing away very early from cancer. And he always credits his philosophical background and capability to the way that he made decisions, the way that he thought about problems, the way that he solved problems, and the way that he succeeded in life. So it is is a superpower. I feel like us having this conversation will help to pass that message along to others. Yeah. The, the, the application of philosophy to business is a funny one because um, – all the way back to the beginning of philosophy itself, um, not not just Socrates, but even before Socrates, philosophers had a reputation for um, just being vagrants, uh, unsuccessful people. Like you can't you can't do anything with this. You know, you're you're, you're it's a useless skill. And one particular philosopher named Thales of Miletus was um, you know trying to teach people in the world, and he kept getting this criticism that like. Who are you to be teaching other people about how to live life when you have not succeeded in life? And his his answer, like, well, I don't consider wealth to be the metric of success, didn't get anywhere. So he said, well, fine, I will, um, I'll resolve this. And so he invents futures trading, and he uh, purchases, and he he does some astronomy, uh, predicts the weather the next year, and buys up the futures of all of the olive presses in the vicinity of Athens um, with all the money he has. He like takes out loans to do it. Very, very risky thing, but he's very certain in his reasoning ability and his reading of the future. And the next olive harvest is this massive success. And he becomes like one of the wealthiest men in Athens. And he's like, all right, now, <laughs> now, now back to what matters. <laughs> which is teaching fault just just have to get that out of the way i suppose for the critics right um that's fascinating yeah so let's kind of change gears a little bit you already alluded sure. to this and and i really kind of want to dive into you know present day and and how your your level of thinking can can go about this so you also collaborate i think with um jack donovan on order of fire if you haven't seen that channel in addition to all of your channels and things which i'll link below Jack Donovan is is a beast when it comes to his way of thinking. Pretty pretty profound. But he posted a video um, about a week or so, I think, before um, Trump was elected, and he talked about you know what's what's going to be the dichotomy between men here, depending on how things go. And he talked about how if Kamala wins, the primary focus of of men in today's society will be fully focused on the progressive approach of effeminence. Um, you cannot be a masculine male and it would really basically force a lot of men to basically just crawl into a corner and, and really give up. Whereas with Trump coming in, having the tribe, having the women, the, excuse me, the winning and the capabilities and the testosterone that comes with being a part of that tribe, it could be a new era for masculinity in that. Um, what's your take on, on Jack's thoughts in that video or your take on that in particular with where we're going now in the era of Trump? Yeah. Oh, well, I think he's, he's pretty much right. Um, I would hope that if Kamala had won, men wouldn't crawl into a corner and go away, but I think there would be a great degree of, of, uh, going galt to, to borrow a, a randism, um, of men kind of dropping out even beyond uh, the the degree to which they have already dropped out, you know, um, there are uh, I believe over a million American expats living in Mexico. Um, more many, most of them older men. Um, many others are in Bali, Indonesia. I've I've worked with some in, during the brief period I worked at Microsoft. Um, they. Uh, men are, are leaving the country because this is not a place for us. You know, um, my, my version of that would be just moving further into the, the sort of mountains of, of Idaho or Montana or Wyoming somewhere, you know, hiding away. Just, I mean, uh, my, my best friend growing up thought that me not going to college was kind of a version of that. But we, we've been seeing this trend for a while with many men not going to college, not pursuing all these jobs, because 
what's in it for me? You know, why should I do this? It's it's not to go back to what we were talking about before, but I, I think it's it's another instance of this uh, th this repetition of the psychological dynamics of history. Uh, it's Achilles saying, you know, what harm have the Trojans done to me? I have come here for honor and glory. That's being denied to me. My honor and glory are being denied to me by an inferior who thinks he's my superior. So why should I fight? I'm going to stay back and stay out because I have, I, you know, none of the none of the physical rewards are worth my life. And um, I mean, that's I think that's been metaphorically true for the last 20 years as we look at greater odds of something like World War III, of, of the, the serious conflicts going on in various parts of Europe and the Middle East, uh, bringing in other actors. Uh, that's that's less metaphorical, maybe more more real. Why should I go and die for Ukraine or for Israel or for you know, Taiwan or, or wherever, why should I even die for the United States if the United States fundamentally does not like or appreciate and does not honor what I want to, to bring to the table? And what we've seen conversely is, um, you know, profound appreciation for men return. And I feel like the, the it wasn't just that Trump won. It was that he won the popular vote, and winning the popular vote was like a, um, it was like an em the emperor has no clothes moment. It was the, the the realization that all these people who had been pretending to believe these things suddenly realized they don't need to pretend anymore. They're they're not going to be bullied by these, um, you know, social justice activists. Whose primary modus operandi was was just bullying people into non-existence, um, and, and it's like, no, you, you're actually the bad guys here, and and now everyone else can see it. <laughs> we 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 we've broken the, the this sort of spell of consensus that had been crafted by moralizing language, um, and it's been a, an extraordinarily liberating thing, I think, for the whole country. With without a doubt, you know, I feel like this this weight that that night as I was watching kind of fell off of my shoulders. Finally, somebody now has said it. They've made it OK to feel this way and they've made it OK for others to at least express their feelings a little bit more without fear of the retribution that comes along with it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a profound sea change. I almost think it's a fourth turning. I'm not sure if you follow or subscribe to the, the fourth turning yep. component to it. You know, maybe we avoided the really painful part of the fourth turning by finally getting to this point to now being able to move forward and dismantle a little bit more of what they were trying to um put the, 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 the male, the man of, of American society into this specific box. Maybe, maybe, um, this is another one of those, like you look back in history and you're like, Oh no. Um, you know, no defeat is final. No victory is absolute. Um, there was a book that the author Christopher Hitchens wrote many years ago about Osama bin Laden. Um, and I think he finished it after Osama bin Laden had been killed. And he concluded with a quote from some novel, I don't remember, but he says, well, the, the, the dog is dead, but the bitch that bore him is always in heat. It's like kind of a, kind of a vulgar line, but it sort of conveyed the, the, the sort of visceral, uh, rough reality of, of the conflict that we are always in, um, whether it's with um, people like Bin Laden, or whether it's with, um, you know, ideological. Um, I'm a big fan of James Lindsay, so ideological Gnostics and and uh, this sort of Marxist or Hegelian of, of any strain, um, idealists that are trying to uh, break the world in order to find utopia. Um, 
you know, th that, that battle will never be over forever, you know? So we, we can't let our guard down and we can't be, uh, we, we can't even hope for a, uh, some kind of conclusion. We can just take a breath, enjoy the good stuff, touch grass, you know, push our kids on a swing and, uh, prepare for the next round. You and James Lindsay are kindred souls. He just was on a uh, Trigonomics, uh, one of the podcasts today, um, talking. He's yeah, that man is he's he's a boss when it comes to intellectual capabilities. And and you bring up a really good point when you talk about, you know, I I would venture to guess that seventy to eighty percent of the country doesn't subscribe to the the woke the um, trans component, which we can talk about if you like a little bit, um, and all of sure. that, but you do have that other 20, 15, 20% who are dead set on the notion that we need to continue this come hell or high water. Um, and I think it's really starting with, and James Lindsay talked about it this morning as I was listening to this, it starts in the schools, um, whether it's the elementary schools or especially of course, is the, the, the universities and the higher education um, they will still continue to pursue that for our young men and boys to try to push them to either just being more effeminate, as we talked about, um, or to embrace that ideology in total. So um, do, you, do you see that, one? And um, how do we combat that, too? Well, I wish I could say. Um, I would have said so um, 13, 14 years ago when I was... was attending college briefly uh i went to a, a small college in bellevue that was sort of in many ways at the cutting edge of a lot of this liberal stuff they were they were pushing forward this idea of bias incidents before it was a thing nationally and i, I was writing letters and correspondence with the the founda foundation for individual rights and in education or, or fire um about this because there was a lot of first amendment first amendment stuff was sort of my pet subject at the time. Um, and I got very disillusioned with higher education. Um, basically the more I learned about it, higher education was its education in higher education for me. Um, and that's why I decided I am not going to the four year school I got accepted to. I am going to drive a truck. <laughs> and, um, it was, it was that bad that back then in 2014, uh, 2013, 2014. Um, I imagine it's gotten worse, but I can't really say from experience. It sounds worse if all the things James Lindsay says about social emotional learning and the proliferation of that in schools are true, which uh, I mean, it was on a pretty steady trajectory at the time. But I think the percentage of people who actually believe that stuff is um, maybe even lower. I think the vast majority of people, um, They've never even thought about it, really. They just they just register the danger of violating the certain norms. So they repeat the lines, and eventually it gets internalized into a kind of Stockholm syndrome. But, but that's not the same as like deeply held belief. Um, and, and I think if you press people on that, they, they get this kind of shocked look at like how can you disagree with this but they but they don't have any arguments they don't have any actually backing they just have like a few platitudes that everybody says but that don't mean anything and and then th th there's no substance behind it it's it's that's incredibly encouraging you know when when you think okay maybe it is a lot smaller um and now that we're moving into this new era where people can feel comfortable talking about it um we will just grow out of the mindset of that with just the prosperity of, of our society and our life and our um, families and things like that. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, the, and the, the other incredible thing too, when you look back and everyone, it, it's very easy to get a little bit of amnesia about new stuff. But if you look back at how incredibly quickly they shift narratives and sometimes don't just shift, but completely reverse narratives on, on, uh, people or ideas. Um, we could be living in a completely woke world in 2022 and wake up in 2026 and like 
not only is no one woke, but everyone claims that they were never woke. Like, 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 Oceania was, ne we were never at war with Oceania. Like, like, complete cognitive dissonance, uh, forgetfulness. <laughs> that, that, that that's a possibility. COVID. Yeah. You, you yeah, see that with absolutely. COVID in particular. You know, oh, yeah. the, the, we, there were never any lockdowns. No one was ever forced to stay inside their house. No, no, none of this was mandated. No, like the, 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 the gaslighting is extraordinary. Now, to go back in history a little bit, um, again, the, um, some degree of that might be necessary and forgivable. There was a famous case at, at the conclusion of the Peloponnesian War, in, in with between Athens and Sparta, um, there was the installation of the the, the so-called thirty tyrants, these sort of puppet leaders of Athens that were really Spartan-controlled politicians. And there was there was a a brief kind of Athenian civil war of sorts, where the the thirty tyrants were eventually ousted. Um, but the the leaders of Athens realized, you know, we can't let this turn into some kind of blood feud some kind of retribution. So they actually passed a decree that mandated forgetfulness, that mandated that the Athenian public forget anyone's support for the 30 tyrants. If there was some Athenian citizen who had supported the 30 tyrants, the, the Spartan puppets, other Athenians were not allowed to hold that against them or to even remember that they had done that. Um, now, I don't know to what degree you can force someone to think something or to forget something, but if someone is going to choose to believe that they never supported COVID lockdowns, um, I think there's a cost to that because I think real um, autonomy, real agency as an individual requires facing the things you got wrong and having having some moments of real contemplation of how did I get that so wrong, but for the sense for the um, for the sake of civil success, um, if some people want to gaslight themselves and believe that they um, never supported COVID lockdowns, well, that's fine with me. You know, uh, I, I think that will put an unfortunate glass ceiling on their their ability to to think through things and to see the world more clearly but they might not have been inclined in that direction anyways it's so easy to see as we talked about the repeating history how groupthink and societal pressure can pro provide and bring about profound behavior change whether it's 19 40s Germany, whether it's COVID lockdowns, whether it's woke mind virus activity, who knows what's coming next, right? Um, yeah. It's conversations There's like these something. where you can appreciate it. And you look at the philosophy and you study that and you think very um, critically, that allows you to see both sides and have an appreciation for that and, and move forward. Let's, let's quickly talk about education if we can a little bit more. Um, you sure. have four kids. Um, what age are your kiddos? Six, four, almost three, and one. Nice. So the six year old's probably just getting into kindergarten or first grade. Uh, so we're we're kind of go, going the homeschool route. But as far as as far as the, those capabilities go, she has recently learned to read in her head. Uh, but she happily reads to the other kids. Very prolific writer. <laughs> Already That's fantastic. Um, we we are. Again, um, well aligned on that when, again, 2020 came around and we're thinking, okay, our oldest kiddo, um, his name is Bromley. He's nine years old now. He's in third grade. We're looking, do we go to the local public school here in the Colorado area? They had just gotten rid of all the school resource officers, meaning the police officers in the, in the school because they were um, causing problems on a multitude of levels in their mind. And we, being a former firefighter and, and paramedic, I'm looking at this thinking, absolutely not. There's no way I'm not sending my child to a school that's not safe. So we moved and got into a classical school. Um, uh, there's a big classical push here in the Colorado area. Nice. Where they focus on um, ethos, on virtues, on moving forward and teaching kids the classics. And it mm. seems to me that this is so fascinating. And I'd love kind of your take, um, especially even when as it pertains to to homeschooling, but 
teaching both the classics and um, teaching virtue. The the um, the saying at our school, Ascent Classical Academy, is do the good, learn the true, love the beautiful, right? And they read Homer. They dive deeply into this. Um, what's the difference between, you know, your typical public school education and why, in your view, is both homeschool and classical education? Where do kind of those um, play in and, and what's the benefits? Oh, man. So um, I'm going to get a little bit edgy here. Uh, I So we can all agree that, um, you know, political violence is a terrible thing and, and counterproductive almost all the time. Um, however, people who do political violence sometimes have other valuable things to say. And one of the most brilliant essays, I think, by or parts of an essay by um, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, um, which I, I believe is actually wrong about technology for some interesting philosophical reasons. He, he's got a good argument, but there are some holes in it, I think, that can be pushed. But um, his diagnosis of the contemporary liberal academic is that they are, uh, quote, over socialized is his diagnosis. They've become too consensus oriented. Um, and I think the whole school dynamic is, is really, I mean, you, you are, I'm sure very well read about this, you know, the, the Prussian model, it's built for industrial, you know, manufacturers and, and, and factory settings and things like that. It's, it's not made to create people who are independent thinkers and, and capable agents in the world. It's, it's designed to squash that and, and turn them into essentially human robots that are they're productive workers. Now, the problem is it doesn't even do that very well. Uh, what it does do is take them off their parents' plates so that the parents can do things um, and make more money so that we can pay for these schools which, with larger and larger administrative overheads. Um, but uh, if you, as you were talking about, teach kids virtue or um, you don't even necessarily need to use those words, although I think it's always a good thing to prime them with things like that, even if they don't fully understand what they're hearing. Um, our, our path to that has been to try to like get the kids to get along with each other, at the very least, to learn with each other, which is a challenge, but very rewarding when it, when it works. Um, and animals. We have... Um, a dog. We have five or uh, four chickens now. We lost. We had a raccoon incident. Um, and for a brief period, we very, very stupidly had uh, two Nigerian dwarf goats. That was an adventure. Uh, not suburban animals, turns out, uh, though we tried for the better part of a year. <laughs> um, and just the responsibilities that come with that an understanding of where food comes from, uh, what is required in the maintenance of the house. My, my four-year-old son um, is, I mean, he's not really competent to do anything yet, but he really, really wants to. Um, so he actually just about an hour and a half ago went out with me, oh, two and a half hours, uh, went out with me and, and helped me, uh, or at least watched me, uh, change an outlet so that our, our chicken water heater would work again because the, the outlet went bad. Um, so like, just observation and watching. Uh, most of what kids learn is, is from watching. They, they don't learn by being told what to think or, or given tests or whatever. They, they, they learn by imitation. Um, and the problem if you stick them in a public school is they're, they're largely imitating other kids who also don't know what they're doing. And it becomes this weird um, popularity contest, which I always got weirded out when I was in, in public school because some of the teachers would even participate in this weird kind of uh, uh, condescending participation in a popularity culture. They were trying to be cool in the eyes of the kids. Um, and I, I had no idea how to put words to that at the time, but I always, I always thought that was kind of gross. Um, I was more involved in, in soccer and martial arts at, at the time. So my, uh, friends group the people i was hung out with were, were always a mixed range i'd be like 14 and i'd be training with a nine-year-old and i'd be training with a 42 year old um and it's it's fine it's the you know we're all trying to improve um and you don't have this age locked all seventh graders 
you sort of vying in this Jordan Peterson lobster hierarchy game for who's the coolest seventh grader. And then suddenly the chemistry teacher is trying to do seventh grade humor. And you're like, what are you doing? Um, so I, I think hanging, spending more time with adults, letting kids observe adults interacting um, and doing adult things, um, doing chores around the house, doing dishes, having adult conversations, you know, not, not, trying to talk to them like children. Um, I think the, the, the two highlights of my year last year were, um, first of all, getting my journeyman card as an electrician, but second of all, being able to coach my daughter's soccer team, which I realized I spent 16 years of my life training for <laughs> doing soccer. And um, I, I didn't talk to the kids like they were kids. I, I spoke to them like adults. I mean, not like fellow construction workers, but, you, you know, um, give them expectations, give them, you know, uh, affirmation when they do things well, encouragement, explain things like an adult does. And, and they get it, you know, that it, it might take them a moment and they have a hard time focusing because they're, you know, six and seven. Um, but yeah, just that, that, that mixed environment, that intergenerational connection that develops, um, because I think imitation really is the way that kids learn. That's why homeschooling is so important, right? Um, because you can include all of those different components. Um, and, and you hit the nail on the head. In order to teach our children, have them observe us solving, as a dad in particular, a really challenging problem, rather than sending them away to go watch a screen, all right, let's work through this together and, and um, have them learn on the fly. Yeah, couldn't agree more. You know, when I moved up here to um, the northern Colorado area, again, after we got into that school, um, we talked about it initially, but the the loneliness of being a man and a father um, can be pretty profound, right? As we talked about, you get up, you go through this rigmarole throughout the day, and it's so easy for men in particular. I think women have a little bit easier job of it. They have things like um, mothers of preschoolers or mops at their church um, or different activities where they naturally bond together with other mothers and they have those relationships. But that's not really the case for dads. And as I said, it can be really lonely um, to, to go through life, not have that tribe and not have the testosterone that you can build as part of being a part of that, that tribe. So one thing that I did in, in listening to, I think it might've even been Jordan Peterson, like you mentioned, is to purposely go out and find a group of men, a like-minded tribe that shares your virtues, shares your, your perspective and band together to have those conversations and, and be a part of that discussion. So that's one thing that I tried to do. And, and we have a great group. We call them our no code gentlemen society. We try to meet and talk and have our tech streams, but can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on that? How can a tribe of other men benefit a father who's kind of feeling a little lost right now and, and what things can, can they do to help, um, you know, bring that about? Well, I think it, it draws out our, um, our, competitive instinct and um i mean as much as we like to talk about you know the importance of peace and nonviolence, we kind of thrive on conflict we kind of thrive on a degree of competition i was um the closest i ever came to like depression um was i had gotten through about two-thirds of solzhenitsyn's gulag archipelago i could not get any further through that it was just awful. The way I kicked myself out of that was by challenging a good friend of mine to a debate um, on on religion. And, and we've since switched religions. Uh, <laughs> I, I moved away from Christianity and he joined the Catholic Church. But uh, so I guess it worked. Um, but the, um, you know, that that that, uh, that uh, preparation for debate for conflict and for contest is is a, a great reason to get out of bed in the morning. Um, you know, my I've been very fortunate to be in the trades, um, working in, in sort of the blue collar world. All of these trade guys make a hobby out of down talking the work of previous trade guys who've been on the job site. Like, oh, whoever did this didn't know what they were doing. Blah blah blah. And it's it's this kind of machismo, this kind of flexing my own prowess by comparison and it's it's a little bit ridiculous but it's also healthy 
I think. Um, you want to take pride in your work. You want to be the kind of guy that other people will, they'll look at your work and they're like, oh, there's nothing to really say about that. Um, you know, and I, I've been doing more service work recently as opposed to um, new commercial construction. So there's um, there's a little bit of a, a, a subtext of sales competition going on there. And we all try not to be like, salesmen we're, we're still electricians we're tradesmen sales is just kind of part of it but that's not primarily what we are as as it seems to be the case in like real estate or or the car sales world or, or things like that but but there's still that element there and while we are friends and we help each other uh you know share knowledge talk about family stuff talk about hobbies whatever we're also kind of there's a subtext of competition between each other at the same time and i think that's a that's a a comfortable place it's a it's a comfortable tension for men to be in and i think men thrive in that environment um and there, there's a little bit but there's also just camaraderie in being in groups of other men even even without that subtext of, of um competition you can be a little bit looser a little bit more free in your in your language you can be a little bit more relaxed there's there's less um you know the the, the trite platitudes are all coming to mind there's there's less drama there's you know it, it's you don't have the the constant interruptions of children or the the potential you know emotional catastrophe if someone said something that like w women can bring along um and I say this with all the love in the world for my wife. Uh, she would she would counter with all the the silly, stupid things that us guys sometimes do and and certainly do. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, it, th there's some value in in male spaces like that. And I I've developed something like that by accident with a a sort of Homer book club, um, that we've been you know just me and and between two and five other guys will just get together and chat about Nicholson. Um, one of my favorite classes, Greg Nage or Harmer Burton or the, the books themselves. Um, we're, we're just about to start the Iliad again. And there's, there's so much to discuss uh, about the history, about different interpretations. What, what uh, interpretations do we like or dislike? Um, some of the guys have developed very strong opinions about that now. Um, and there's one guy who's an Orthodox Christian in our group. So we have fun kind of dancing each other a little bit. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's just a different environment than the sort of, um, the sort of HR driven corporate world that the public school system sort of psychologically prepares us for, um, which doesn't feel like home to anybody who, um, wants to run their own life. I I feel exactly what you're saying. You know, we can lay our guard down. We can feel confident to say what we want without the HR world coming on us. And, and to your point, you have the competition, which also drives you to pursue more, be more successful, make more money, be a better father, be a better husband. So yeah. Um, that's, that's a fantastic insight. I appreciate it. So let's, let's switch it up a little bit. Um, sure. let's do some rapid fire questions if we can 20, 30 mm -hmm. seconds, whatever you feel comfortable with. We'll kind of go through these really fast. Um, so the first one, can you give me your appreciation or your definition, I guess, so to speak of ethos? Ethos. E ethos is your, um, your claim to identity. Ethos is, is, uh, I mean, it's your, your, your character and your, belonging to a group and your right to speak on behalf of a group. And we should probably finish that up with pathos, logos. How do those fit in? Pathos is, is emotion, basically. Um, and logos is a very tricky word to um, articulate exactly. But it's basically argument. It's, 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 it's logic or order or reason. Um, some people might translate it as truth, though that's touchy. It's not quite right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's logical reasoning expressed in language. Iliad and Odyssey are at the top of this list, but what other philosophy books are required reading in your mind for men or dads? 
Oh man. Well, first of all, I don't think Iliad and Odyssey aren't exactly philosophy. They're they're sort of classical Fair. poetry, uh, epic stories. But um, I'm going to uh, challenge the question. I think uh, uh, and defer to Martin Heidegger and, and his advice when he was asked how do people get into philosophy. He says start anywhere and keep going. Um, it's all about slowing down your thinking and and being methodical and circumspect and contemplative you will eventually end up at plato's republic but you don't have to start there understood so kind of keeping on that on that path then so um give me your pitch for somebody who's listening to this right now or picking up and reading books by plato as an example um what's the reason they should be picking up anything by plato well because you don't want to live your life wrong you don't want to the, the the opening of the republic for example is you know socrates is asking cephalus you know what's it like to be old because there's some people who seem to think that being old is terrible but you don't seem to think so and how you live your life has a lot to do with how you feel when you're older and whether you look back with pride or with regret on your deathbed same question for homer obviously iliad odyssey any other books well, the, the case for Homer is he's the foundation for all of Western thought, including religion, including Christianity. If you want to understand the culture that created you, if you want to understand yourself, Homer is the skeleton key. It's motivation enough. Machiavelli, I know you love the prince. I know you love Machiavelli. What's a good reason to, to read him? Oh, Love might be a strong word. Uh, <laughs> I think, I mean, Mach Machiavelli was the creator of political science uh, and the idea that there is a a, a, a method to f acquiring and maintaining political power. Um, you won't understand how the world works politically if you don't read Machiavelli, because everyone in power, no matter what they say, are functionally Machiavellians. And the, the quick short introduction to that is there's a there's a short little film on YouTube called uh, Rules for Rulers by CGP Grey. It's weirdly one of my youngest my daughter's favorite videos, um, but uh, it's basically an introduction to why are all of politics corrupt? And there's a reason for that, um, but you you won't understand the world. You'll be stuck in naive idealism if you don't understand that. One person I haven't heard you mention is Marcus mm. Aurelius. Uh, meditations. Mm. Is that something that you uh, not necessarily subscribe to, but appreciate? Or is that um, kind of a different component? So Stoicism was sort of my, my, my stepping stone back into philosophy when I was in high school. Um, I enjoyed it. There's a, a lovely little book by William Irving called The Guide to the Good Life. Um, and I, I appreciated Marcus Aurelius. As a philosopher, I think Marcus Aurelius is highly overrated. There are nice things uh, about the worldview of Epictetus and Seneca, and Zeno to a degree. I think as a therapist and as a giver of good life advice and general wisdom, Mark, you could do far worse than Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius is a, a fantastic bedside table um, company, you know. Um, that's sort of different than philosophy, so to speak. It's just speaking from life experience, and that's that's fine. I have a kind of bad taste in my mouth with Marcus Aurelius in particular because he's been tarnished by a, a certain philosophy popularizer who has done what I expressed concern about at the beginning in, in bringing down philosophy by trying to bring it to more people uh, by a gentleman named Ryan Holiday, who I'm um, very, very much not a fan of. <laughs> Okay. Um, but, but Ryan Holiday, notwithstanding, um, there's a lot of good stuff in the Stoics and there's a lot of good stuff in Aurelius, but he, I, he wouldn't be at the top of my like excellent philosophers list. Understood. Yeah. And I can see where you're coming from with Ryan Holiday. I've read a lot of his stuff. He's democratized stoicism to his credit, um, and, and taken it. So, but, um, yeah, maybe a conversation for another day. Okay. I only have three questions left for you. Um, the, before we do that, as, as we get ready to, to land this plane, where can people 
CB Robinson, find you, get a hold of you, see your stuff. Oh man. Well, I, I spend too much time on Instagram. Uh, <laughs> so you can always find me there at caffeine philosophy. I have uh, a bunch of stuff on my blog, which is just caffeine and philosophy.com, including uh, my four books. You can read those all for free on the blog. Um, they are also on Amazon, but yeah, if you don't want to pay for it, you can just read them on the blog. It's, it's fine. Um, uh, the, the, the stuff I've been most proud of recently, I think, I think really my best writing and work has been with the order of fire with Jack Donovan. I've got some, some essays about science and about postmodernism and the history of philosophy really. And a few other things in, um, in the, uh, Journal of Solar Culture, which is on Amazon and also the, the Order of Fire website. And I think the thing I'm most proud of that I've put out on the internet ever was, was um, Jack and my walkthrough of Plato's Republic, which is unfortunately longer in audio form than the Republic itself. Uh, but it's very worthwhile if you want to, to take it seriously. I don't, I don't think I, I'm going to be bold. Uh, I don't think anyone's done a better walkthrough. Um, so bold claim, uh, maybe Michael Millerman will, will has something behind a paywall that completely blows us out of the water. Michael Millerman is fantastic. Um, but, uh, not nothing public facing that he's got out. I don't think beats us. Um, very valuable for anyone who likes, who, who's interested in Plato and, and understanding what on earth is going on in that very strange dialogue. Um, because it is deceptively complex. And fascinating, and one one could spend an entire lifetime studying uh, the Republic and, and never never really get to the bottom of what's going on there, which is maybe the point. It's fascinating. I will link all of that down below. So three more questions. I think these are some of the more um, important ones for for dads to to kind of get an appreciation from you, sir. Um, so the first one is how can study how can studying classical philosophy help dads be better at life? Well, I think given the world that we live in, that's trying to, to sort of alienate men, the male role in the house, both, both to his kids and to his wife, is to be a world creator, so to speak. He sets the standards for what is good, what is bad, what's evil, and rewards his family when they, when they do well. It, it takes a certain kind of vision and thoughtfulness to set forth those standards and to create that world in a way that makes sense. You have to be a sort of uh, a shaman of sorts, not, not, not even necessarily a creator of the world, but a guide into the, the, a better view of reality than what the public is trying to offer. And it takes a great deal of skill to, to, to perform that role well for your family, um, to be that, that, spirit guide. Um, and I think, I think philosophy is a tremendous tool to assist in that function. It, it can allow you to take on the, the force of culture in its entirety and win because you have the advantage because you live with these people and you, you, you know, sleep with them, you eat with them, you work alongside them, you work, live in the same house together. And if you have bring this skill, you can beat culture. Um, doesn't mean it's not a tough fight, but philosophy is tremendously valuable as a tool in that battle. You have a six-year-old as your oldest, which means you mm -hmm. basically have 12 seasons left before she is, is out of the house and, and moving on. Um, and, and those 12 seasons can be very quick. The days are long, but the years are short, as they say. Um, how do we make the most of the very short season we have with our kiddos and really enjoy every moment of it? Yeah, that's 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 the question, isn't it? I, I, I've become fascinated by these kinds of lines of wisdom that no matter how many times you hear it as a kid, you never take it seriously until you already know it from experience. And they grow up so fast as one of those. Um, the best I can do is say, it seems to be about attention. It seems to be about where do we direct our focus and how much room, how, how much leash do we give 
our our devices, our work, our you know other people and and things in our lives to to take our attention from us. Um, we we can't be idiots. We can't completely withdraw from society. It, an idiot in the Greek sense was a private person. Um, but you need to to maintain some attention because your attention is your life. Attention is the, the the substance, the subjective substance of life, and and that's what we don't want to miss with these kids. Although I will say I'm, I I get more excited for them and about them as they get older. So I I I don't think they'll hit seventeen or eighteen. And I'll be like, where did all the years go? I'll I'll, I'll still be in the I can't wait to see what they do, um, mindset. And I'm you know of course happy with what they have done. I'm already excited about what they're doing, even if it's slightly mischievous sometimes. That's right. That's right. Last question, sir. Mm -hmm. And um, this doesn't have to be related to anything that we've talked about today. Um, I follow a, a guy named Graham Cocker and he does a lot of kind of business advice stuff. And when he ends his podcast, he, he asks this similar question. It's basically the diamond advice. So your four kiddos, again, just like we talked about, they're all grown up. They're out of the house. You've taught them as much as you can, but they've forgotten everything all the lessons you've taught them, except for one, one lesson, what one lesson, what diamond advice would you want your kids to take with them? If that was all they had. Worship quality. And excellence. That will, I think if, if you could only take one bit, that will that will take you as as far in everything else that matters as any other single rule I can think of. CB Robertson, you're a gift to this world, sir. We need more people like you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. you've been very generous with your time. Thanks so much for having me. You the, as well. The pleasure's been all mine. 